right, so we're going to begin talking about the urinary system today. And the urinary system is very important in the body. It carries out several important functions. The kidneys are the workhorses of the urinary system, and they do a lot. So the urinary system on the whole is going to filter blood, produce urine, and excrete that urine so that it's removed from the body. So that's the kidneys, the bladder, the ureters, the urethra, all of them working together to get that urine made and out of the body. The kidneys all on their own have some other important functions though. They form calcitriol, which you might remember from last semester is what happens. Um, the UV light hits your skin and converts the precursor to vitamin D to active vitamin D. The vitamin D goes to your liver and is converted to calcidiol. Calcidiol goes to your kidneys and is converted to calcitriol. And calcitriol helps to increase calcium absorption in the small intestine. Calcium is a very important ion in the body, but it's also kind of hard to absorb. It's got these two positive charges. So with calcitriol present in the system, it's easier to absorb that calcium. The next thing that the kidneys are going to do is form erythropoietin. Which when we talk about blood, we said that erythropoietin is going to be released in response to low blood oxygen levels or low red blood cell count. And it is formed in the kidneys and is going to stimulate our red bone marrow to increase erythrocyte production. As part of this filtering blood and producing urine, the kidneys are going to actually help with our osmotic balance. So they're helping to maintain our body fluid levels, our ion levels, and our um, acid-base balance. So that's going to be another important part is that the kidneys regulate ion levels, fluid levels, acid-base balance. So the kidneys are the second system in the body that can act as a buffer all on their own. So the respiratory system can act as a buffer, but the kidneys can also act as a buffer. So they are able to uh, pull excess hydrogen ion right out of your blood. Um, the next thing that they're going to do, the kidneys are going to help with regulating blood pressure. And that's by releasing renin to get the renin angiotensin system going, but also, more importantly, by regulating our fluid levels and our blood volume. So we can say they regulate blood pressure with the renin angiotensin system and by maintaining our um, blood volume or helping to control our blood volume. And then a function that doesn't happen all the time, uh, but in times of extreme starvation, uh, or nutrient deprivation, your kidneys can all actually stimulate gluconeogenesis. But on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, if you have to use gluconeogenesis, it's your liver that does it. So this is only in extreme cases of like extreme starvation. As far as anatomy goes, we're going to talk more about the anatomy of the kidneys in a little bit. Uh, they're the big, they're the workhorses of the um, urinary system. They're doing the big job of filtering our blood and producing urine. We'll talk more about their gross anatomy in just a second. Our uh, ureters are the tubes that conduct urine from the kidneys to the urinary bladder. And they, like other tubes in our system, have three layers. Their outermost layer is adventitia. which is more sturdy than serosa. They have a middle layer, which is actually three layers of smooth muscle. And then they've got an inner layer that is transitional epithelium, that's continuous with the transitional epithelium of the bladder. So, this is the only place in the body that you find transitional epithelial tissue. It's in the urinary system, here in the ureters, and then also in the urinary bladder. So our next important organ is the urinary bladder. On its superficial surface, 
surface it has serosa, but on the lateral surfaces it has adventitia. On the outer layers, um, and then its inner muscular layer or its middle muscular layer is continuous with the muscles in the ureters, and it's called the detrusor muscle. And it's smooth muscle. So it will be able to contract and forcefully expel urine from the body. And then the inner layer is also our transitional epithelium. It's called transitional epithelium because the cells transition in shape depending on the level of distension or stretch in the bladder. So when the bladder is empty, our transitional epithelial cells tend to be more round looking, kind of cuboidal, but then when it's full or distended, they flatten out. So distended just means full or stretched. And they'll start to flatten out. I'm not gonna lie, our distended bladder slides, it's very hard to tell the difference between uh, distended and empty. They're not, it's not a hugely full bladder, but in theory, when you fill totally, these transitional cells will transition in shape and stretch out and flatten out and tend to look more splamic when they do keep oil. She said the um, outer layer is adventitia for the urinary bladder too, right? On the top it's serosa, on the side it's adventitia, which is a little weird. So up here it's serosa. Over here is adventitia. Then the last structure of the urinary system is the urethra, and it's conducting urine out of the body to the external environment. I'm going to write about the urethra up here. So at the superior aspect of the urethra, the detrusor muscle is going to kind of thicken and become the internal urethral sphincter that you don't have voluntary control over. So um, we'll say first that this is the, sh uh, the tube that conducts urine out of the body. It's short in females, it's longer in males because it has to span the whole length of the penis in males. So tube that conducts urine out of the body. say at the superior aspect, the detrusor thickens to become the internal urethral sphincter. This is involuntary. Then at the base of the pelvic floor, we have a second sphincter, the external urethral sphincter. And it's got some skeletal muscle fibers so that you can exert voluntary control over it. But if you are doing tissue damage, if you're really like holding it too much and you're going to stretch your bladder to the point of damage, we can exercise the urination reflex and the smooth muscle will take over and you will relieve yourself of urine. So it's got some skeletal muscle fibers so that you have some voluntary control, usually voluntary control, unless you're getting to like tissue damage, then we'll engage your reflex. To start an introduction to physiology today, I will tell you about the processes that are involved in urine formation. We'll talk a little bit more about them at the end of the lecture, but we're going to pick up on Thursday going through physiology in detail. Um, but as far as the processes that are involved with uh, forming urine go, we have filtration. And filtration occurs anytime you push a fluid against a semi-permeable membrane and start squeezing stuff out. So that's how urine formation is going to begin. We're going to filter our blood by squeezing it up against these um, fenestrated capillaries and produce filtrate. So this will be 
Um, basically pushing blood against fenestrated capillaries. and forcing solutes out of it. This is going to give us a, a fluid that we call filtrate. This is going to happen in a very specific part of the kidney that we'll talk about in a little bit. The second process that is going to be involved is what we call tubular reabsorption. Some books just call it reabsorption. But it's reabsorption because you absorbed this stuff once in your small intestine. It became part of your blood. And it was floating around in your blood. And then we filtered it out. And so now we got to pull it back in. So this is bringing useful materials back into the blood from that filtrate. And then the last process that we have is called tubular secretion. People have a hard time wrapping their minds around tubular secretion. Tubular secretion is going to be when there's stuff floating through the blood that we want to concentrate in the urine. So it kind of helps to think that secretion leads to excretion. So this is removing unwanted materials from the blood and concentrating it in the urine. And again, you can remember that secretion, specifically tubular secretion, leads to excretion. All right, so as far as the gross anatomy of our kidney goes, the kidney is a retroperitoneal organ, which means it sits outside of the peritoneum in the abdominal cavity. So it's posterior to the peritoneum that's protecting the rest of your abdominal organs. So it has to have some um, special connective tissue to kind of keep it protected. None of that is imaged here. So, well, we could maybe say that this outer layer is a capsule. So the most superficial layer is what's called renal fascia. And this is fibrous connective tissue that holds our kidneys to the wall, to your abdominal wall. Deep to that, we have a second layer of connective tissue called the perirenal fat pad. So peri always means around. Renal is referring to the kidneys. And fat refers to adipose tissue. So this is adipose tissue that protects the kidney from things like trauma and force. And then we have an inner fibrous capsule, which is kind of, it's this outer layer that is keeping the kidney, kind of giving the kidney its shape. So it's very thin. It's a thin layer of fibrous connective tissue that is giving a border for the kidney. All of this tissue inside the kidney, in this region here, is what's called parenchymal tissue. And it's organized into two regions, what we call an outer cortex and an inner medulla. So our outer cortex, cortex is this parenchymal tissue on the outside, and it's actually going to penetrate into the medulla, forming these things called renal columns. So if this is our outer cortex out here, it's going to poke in between our medullary, what are called medullary pyramids. We'll look at those again in a second. But this is all cortical tissue poking into there, forming renal columns. So we can say this is cortical tissue that uh, dips into the medulla. So those renal columns are kind of, um, you can see them back here running behind these blood vessels in this model. Uh, they're not the easiest to see there. You'll be able to see them when we do the dissection. 
What? what? Yeah, they're parenchymal. So let me write it over here. Oops, wait. Hang up. Can I write it over here? <laughs> parenchymal tissue is what the kidney's made of. But it's split into this outer cortex and the inner medulla. Actually, this isn't in here. Mm. Then in our inner medulla, this tissue is organized into what we call renal pyramids. So you can kind of see here, it looks like a pyramid. These are our renal pyramids. And we could just say this is medullary tissue that is separated by our renal columns. And each of these renal pyramids is ending or terminating on what's called a renal papilla. So maybe we've seen it before where if you have this like pokey out region like that, it's a papilla. So this is found at the end. Each of these renal papilla are found at the end of our renal pyramids and they're draining all of the urine that's being produced in that renal pyramid. pyramid and all of the cortical tissue above it we call a lobe. So this is a lobe and a lobe again is just one renal pyramid and the cortical tissue above it. So this region here, this kind of indented region, is the renal hilum. Like we had a hilum in our lungs, we have a hilum in our uh, kidneys. And in this renal hilum, let me rewrite this. In this renal hilum, you'll have entering more things than this. On this model, you can see it. You've got a renal artery entering, a renal vein exiting, and a ureter also exiting. So those are the structures that you find in the renal hilum. A ureter, an art, a branch of the, well, a renal artery and a renal vein. In this region that's kind of draining away, before we get to the ureter, so D would be the ureter, and this is leading to what's called the renal pelvis. All right, so let's talk about the microanatomy. So the workhorse of the kidney is what's called a nephron. And it's got the busy job of filtering our blood and producing urine. So this is the workhorse of the kidney. We've got two types of nephrons we'll look at in greater detail in just a minute, but we should talk about a, ne a nephron's structure in general. This region here is what we call the renal corpuscle. And this is going to be where we're doing filtration. So this first process in urine formation filtration is happening in the renal corpuscle. That's the only place that's doing filtration. So we're gonna filter blood at the renal corpuscle, and then the fil the, that fluid that has been filtered out of the blood is going to enter this next part of the, of the nephron, which is called the renal tubule. Our renal corpuscle has two parts, what's called the glomerulus, which is this specialized region of fenestrated capillaries running through here. And the second part is what's going to collect our filtrate that's being pushed out of the blood, and that's called the glomerular capsule. For now, we'll just say this captures 
filtering. So the renal tubule has three parts. This first part is called the proximal convoluted tubule. Proximal because it's close to the glomerulus. It's the first place that the filtrate is going to enter after it leaves the glomerular capsule. Convoluted because it's really twisty and turny. So this is our proximal convoluted tubule or PCT, which I will abbreviate it from now on as PCT. This is going to lead into the next region, which is called our nephron loop. We've got a descending limb and an ascending limb. So our, our next region is the nephron loop, which has descending and ascending limbs. And then it leads away, this nephron loop leads away into the last part of the tubule called the distal convoluted tubule. Distal because it's relative to the whole path that this fluid is following. It's far away from the glomerulus. Although in real life, it sits very close to it. So we'll see, it, and there's a picture in your book, I think, that does good justice of showing the relationship to it. Um, I think it's figure 24.7. And you can also see it in figure 24.8. So the distal convoluted tubule wraps back around and is actually close to the glomerulus, but as far as the path that the fluid is following, it's far away. So that's our last part, is our distal convoluted tubule, or DCT, which I will be abbreviating it as from now on. So filtration happens up here in the renal corpuscle, and then reabsorption and secretion are going to happen all around, along the rest of the length of our renal tubule. When we get to the distal convoluted tubule, that is all under hormonal control. But we'll talk about the details of that on Thursday when we go through physiology. All right, any questions so far? So a lot of times what you'll see in books to kind of make it easier is you'll see a glomerulus and this, the glomerulus is kind of a specialized structure. It's really interesting. It's got an arterial leading into it that we call the afferent arterial. Afferent is always approaching, so our afferent arterial is bringing in blood. Then we get into the glomerulus, and those are fenestrated capillaries. So and our, if we look at our afferent arterial coming in, it's got a pretty wide diameter. And then exiting away from here, we have our efferent arterial. The blood leaving here is still oxygenated. We haven't, we're not doing gas exchange here. What's happening here is we are filtering our blood. So these fenestrated capillaries are going to allow that to happen. So in this glomerulus, these are our fenestrated capillaries. And this glomerular capsule surrounds this glomerulus and it's going to lead away into our proximal convoluted tubule. So your book kind of images it like this, and you'll see that most textbooks will stretch it out so that it's kind of easier to see what's going on. So our blood comes in here, and we've got this thick or wide diameter afferent arterial. The blood gets kind of, uh, it really, you put a lot of pressure on it uh, by having a, a smaller diameter of your efferent arterial. And then since we have these fenestrations, then you can force out lots of stuff. So anything like, you're not going to be pushing out big proteins and things, but 
um, very small solutes will be able to easily pass out of that and enter this fluid now that right here in the capsule is called filtrate. As soon as this filtrate enters our proximal convoluted tubule, we're going to start doing stuff to it, so we'll call it tubular fluid. But if we look at the rest of our nephron, this will be our proximal convoluted tubule here. It's going to lead away to our thick wall descending limb. Then we've got a thin wall descending limb. We go around a hairpin turn. And we've got a thin wall descending limb. Then we get a thick wall descending limb. And then this is going to lead away into our distal convoluted tubule. Our distal convoluted tubule is going to drain into collecting tubules that drain into collecting ducts. So here's our nephron loop. Here's our distal convoluted tubule. It's not as long as our proximal convoluted tubule. It's all under hormonal control. It's going to drain into a little collecting tubule. Many collecting tubules are going to drain into one collecting duct. And our collecting ducts are going to carry that urine down to our renal papilla. So we'll just say these end at a renal papilla. typically how you see our uh, nephron's image. It's kind of easier to spread it out than look at it all twisted up in the body. So when we're looking at the different processes that are happening, we're going to be doing reabsorption and secretion throughout the rest of our renal tubule. And this fluid then passing through here, we would call tubular fluid. Most of our reabsorption and secretion is happening in the proximal convoluted tubule. As we come down through our nephron loop, it's setting up an osmotic pressure gradient so that we can have maximal water reabsorption in the collecting duct. But again, we'll go through all these details on Thursday. When we get to the distal convoluted tubule, this is under hormonal control. So when we said aldosterone could increase sodium reabsorption, aldosterone is having its effect at the distal convoluted tubule. So we'll talk about all of those details starting on Thursday. All right, we've got different types of nephrons. And there are different types depending on uh, how, where we find them. And so if you look, if we have our outer cortical tissue here, so let's say this is the cortex, and then deep down here we have our medulla. Passing through here, we've got a collecting duct. It's going to drain into a renal papilla. Then, as far as our nephron goes, we've got two kinds of nephrons. We've got the first kind that are called cortical nephrons, and they are found almost entirely in the cortex. So they've got their renal corpuscle, and they may their nephron loops may dip down into the medulla a little bit, but they are primarily found all in the cortex. So these have little or no nephron loops, and these are going to, after the blood flows around them, we'll, we'll look at blood flow in a minute, but after our blood exits our efferent arterial, it's going to swirl around what are called peritubular capillaries, and then back out in the veins that are going to take it back into the, um, back to the general circulation. So these are cortical nephrons. We could say they have little uh, to no nephron loop in the cortex or in the medulla. So they're just filtering blood, making urine, not doing a whole lot as far as our physiology of blood pressure is concerned. The other ones. The, the, our second type are called juxtamedullary. So juxta always means 
next to, and these are juxtamedullary because they're next to the medulla. So we've got our renal corpuscle and our proximal convoluted tubule. Then they have these long nephron loops that dip down into the medulla. And then we've got our distal convoluted tubule. Let's pretend it's wrapping back, um, back around in the body and dumping into this collecting duct. So our, du our juxtamedullary nephrons have these really long nephron loops that are dipping down into the medulla. And these are really important for water conservation. So then by default, they can also help with blood volume and blood pressure. So you can look at different animals and tell how important it is for them to um, hang on to water. So if you look at fish, they have, like their nephron loops are not dipping down in the medulla. They have to pretty much be excreting urine all the time because they're, they're sitting in, in water, so they're constantly absorbing water. But if you look at kangaroo rats, they can actually, they have huge nephron loops that dip really far down in the medulla. And what that does is it sets up this osmotic pressure gradient. We'll see on Thursday when we go through the details, but that it makes them able to pull so much water out of their urine so that a, a kangaroo rat who lives in the desert can drink salt water and actually get water out of it. We can't do that. We drink salt water and it's isotonic with blood, so it does us no good to drink salt water. But they can actually get water out of it because they've got these huge nephron loops dipping down, way down into the medulla. So those are our two types of nephrons. And again, they're going to dump into collecting tubules to dump into collecting ducts. So collecting ducts will have many collecting tubules draining into them and then that collecting duct will drain into a renal papilla. Before we move away from here, I kind of mentioned these uh, blood vessels running up here around the tubular system. These are called peritubular. Again, peri meaning around, and around the tubules, peritubular capillaries. So once blood exits the glomerulus in the um, efferent arterial, it will swirl around our peritubular capillaries and that's when we'll have nutrient and gas exchange. Our, the other types of blood vessels that you'll see surrounding like our nephron loop here are called vasa recta. And so our vasa recta are going to swirl around and this will be the site of nutrient and gas exchange in our um, nephron loops down here uh, in our medulla. And these are going to be really important for helping us to get this water, uh, this osmotic pressure gradient going. So these are still capillaries, and, but they're capillaries that are coming down around our nephron loops. So our afferent, our efferent arterial would leave with oxygenated blood and bring it to the vasa recta. We'll do nutrient and gas exchange to serve the kidney tissue, and then we'll pick that deoxygenated blood back up in venules that are going to lead away into our renal veins eventually. So we'll talk more about the juxtaglomerular apparatus on Thursday, but this is an important um, structure as far as maintaining our blood pressure goes, and this is really going to help with all of that like sensing sodium levels, sensing water levels. It's really going to be important for the kidney's ability to recognize like drops in blood pressure. And so it's called the juxtaglomerular glomerular apparatus because it's near the glomerulus. So if we've got our big afferent arterial coming in and our small efferent arterial exiting, Our distal convoluted tubule is going to wrap through the parenchymal tissue and come back around and be in close contact with our afferent arterial. So this is actually a branch of our distal convoluted tubule. And this juxtaglomerular apparatus, let me write that down. So juxta, again, near. And this is near the glomerulus. is also abbreviated as JGA. So this is the juxtaglomerular apparatus. This is going to be important for responding to um, drops in blood pressure, which is sensed as a, a, a 
decrease in stretch on this afferent arterial. But it's also going to res respond to levels of sodium chloride coming through the discal convoluted tubule, which is also a sign that we're not doing enough filtration. Well, depending on if you've got too much or too little sodium chloride. So we'll talk more about that on um, when, so Thursday, but I just want to uh, kind of make you aware of what it's doing now. So it responds to drops in blood pressure and it's sensitive to sodium chloride levels in urine. So our distal convoluted tubule, we said, was under hormonal control. So if you've got low levels of sodium chloride coming through, then we can release aldosterone and um, or we can alter our glomerular filtration rate and our distal convoluted tubule can respond by um, uptaking sodium from the system if need be or we can pull more sodium out of the urine and add it to the um, urine that's flowing through. So we'll talk more about that um, on Thursday. But the two types of cells that are present are cells here in the afferent arterial called JG cells and these are responding to levels of stretch and they respond to sympathetic nervous system activation. The cells in the distal convoluted tubule that are sensing sodium chloride levels are called macula densa. The cells are also going to be able to release renin. So our JG cells release the renin. So if you've got a lot of sodium chloride coming through, then we're saying there's a lot of filtration going on and that's bad. If we've got a little bit of sodium chloride going through, then we say we don't have enough filtration going on, that's also bad. So we have to keep the rate of filtrate produced pretty constant, but we'll talk more about that on Thursday. This is the mechanism in the kidney that's going to be able to help do that though. Our juxtaglomerular cells are responding to, to these drops in blood pressure, which we can tell as like a, a level of stretch, basically. They also respond to sympathetic nervous system activation. The last thing we have to talk about as far as anatomy goes, because you have to be able to identify it, is blood flow through the kidney. So these white guys here are arteries. So our renal artery is bringing in oxygenated blood into our kidneys. So that's right here, our renal artery. It branches into what are called segmental arteries. So these guys we'll call number two are our segmental arteries. Our segmental arteries are going to branch into interlobar arteries. So we'll call that number three. Our interlobar arteries are going to branch into these arteries that run parallel with the surface of our kidney. So we'll call these number four. These are called arcuate arteries. Our arcuate arteries are going to shoot up into these little guys that are called that are called interlobular arteries. Our interlobular arteries are going to give rise to our afferent arterial, which you can't really see on here. So number five are our interlobular arteries. From there, our blood enters the afferent arterial. It's filtered through the glomerulus. We'll exit the renal corpuscle in an efferent arterial. From there, it's going to go through our peritubular capillaries. Or our vasa recta. 
that point we'll have nutrient and gas exchange. Our then oxygen deprived blood is going to enter our interlobular veins. So those are going to run with our interlobular arteries. So we go into our, we'll say this is number six. Interlobular veins. Our interlobular veins are going to empty into arcuate veins. Number seven. From our inter or our arcuate veins, we'll drain into interlobar veins. Number eight. And then we don't have segmental veins, so our interlobar veins are going to drain right back into our renal vein, number nine. So that's blood flow through the kidney, and you can see the veins are pretty hard to see, but our arteries are pretty well labeled. So our renal artery is giving rise to our segmental arteries, into our interlobar arteries, into our arcuate arteries, into our interlobular arteries. That gives rise to our afferent and efferent arterioles. From there, oxygenated blood will enter the peritubular capillaries or the vasa recta. We'll have nutrient and gas exchange. Then our oxygen poor blood will enter our interlobular veins, dump into our arcuate veins. From our arcuate veins, go into interlobar veins, and our interlobar veins are going to drain right into our renal vein. So then from our efferent, we'll go to our peritubular capillaries or the vasa recta, have nutrient and gas exchange. Then our deoxygenated blood will enter interlobar veins. I'm sorry, interlobular veins first, then arcuate veins, then interlobar veins, but we don't have segmental veins. Our interlobar veins just drain right into the renal vein. So it's oxygenated blood that leaves the efferent arteriole. We have nutrient and gas exchange in the peritubular capillaries or our vasa recta capillaries. Then everything gets picked back up in our veins. All right, then the last thing I want to talk about today is what type of fluid we have in each area. So this glomerulus is blown up down here, but that's what's actually happening up here. And in the glomerulus, that first place where we have this capsular space, so you can see the glomerulus is, is this afferent arterial leading into these fenestrated capillaries, the efferent arterial exits. The fluid that enters this capsular space is called filtrate. Filtrate is only found in the capsular space. Because as soon as we enter the proximal convoluted tubule, we're going to start doing stuff to it. So the proximal convoluted tubule is going to be this region that leads away first from our glomerulus. So in the proximal convoluted tubule, we have what we'll call tubular fluid. As that fluid passes through our descending nephron loop and up our ascending nephron loop and into the distal convoluted tubule, it's still tubular fluid. So we'll say that we still have tubular fluid in our nephron loop and our distal, or our, I'll just abbreviate it, our DCT, our distal convoluted tubule. That fluid is still tubular fluid when it enters our collecting tubules. And then as it enters our collecting ducts, we're going to start reclaiming water. As we get to the bottom of our collecting ducts, we're pulling out as much water as we can and we're concentrating all of our waste so that by the time we get to the bottom and reach our papillary ducts, that's this little branch that leads into our renal papilla, that's when it's urine. So in our distal convoluted tubule, or from our distal convoluted tubule, into our collecting tubules and ducts, we could still call it tubular fluid. So all of that
that is still tubular fluid. When we get to the bottom of our collecting ducts, we call that a papillary duct. And now that fluid, we've re reclaimed all of the water that we can. There's nothing else we can do to it. It's entering the papilla. It's going to be removed from the body soon. It's urine. So our urine is first collected in papillary ducts. These are going to drain into our renal papilla. Where we have all of these renal papilla kind of coming together in this small area, we call that a minor calyx. A minor, our minor calyces are going to merge to form these major calyces. So we'll go from a renal papilla to a minor calyx. a major calyx. Our major calyces are all draining into this renal pelvis. So it drains all into the renal pelvis. The renal pelvis conducts it away to the ureter. From the ureter we will temporarily store it in the bladder. I'm going to go over here where I have more room. From the bladder urine will enter the urethra and be removed from the body. The filtrate is only found in the glomerular capsule. Tubular fluid is found throughout most of the rest of the nephron through our collecting tubules and ducts where we're reclaiming all of our water. Once we pull back all of our water and get to the end of that collecting duct, it becomes urine. That urine is going to dump into this renal papilla, which conducts it first to a minor calyx, then to our major calyces. So this region here would be a minor calyx. This would be a major calyces. They're going to dump into the renal pelvis. Then from there we go to the ureter, from the ureter to the urinary bladder. Then you can exert some voluntary control over your urination reflex. It will exit the body through the urethra. And that's how we rid ourselves of waste.